I'd like to welcome um, all of you to our final session of the day for Connected North at Home on our very, very first day of Connected North at Home. It's great to see you and to see others that were here um, throughout the day to join for some other sessions. It's wonderful. I'd like to introduce you to a really great friend of Connected North. Her name is Corrine and she is the educator at the Royal Botanical Gardens. Uh, she's an amazing teacher and uh, so knowledgeable and today we're going to learn about monarch butterflies and the very hungry caterpillar and insects and all sorts of really cool things. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Corrine. And if you have any uh, questions for Corrine, we're going to, to stop a couple of times and take some questions and we'll do our best to ensure that everybody has their questions answered. So over to you, Corrine. Well, then, thank you so much, Mally, and welcome everybody to Royal Botanical Gardens. And actually, I'm in my basement, so I'm doing these programs here, but I'm really from Royal Botanical Gardens, and I'm glad that we can share all these wonderful things about insects and how, we, how important they are. So I'm going to start, first of all, by acknowledging that you have come from quite a distance away, some of you, and and just a minute, there we go. And I'd like to share, first of all, uh, the map of where you are, because you are from a huge area. So some of you have come all the way from Nunavut, from Ontario. I know there's people from Michigan as well. So welcome everybody. And Royal Botanical Gardens is all the way down here. So we're on the southwest tip of Lake Ontario, and I'll just go a little bit closer just to give you an idea of what it's like. So, um, and we are surrounded by cities, so many different cities. Uh, we've got Hamilton, Burlington, all the way up to Toronto, way up there. This is Lake Ontario right here. And Royal Botanical Gardens, and I'll just go a little bit closer, is this huge oasis of green. It's this whole area, and I hope you can see that when I'm pointing it out with my mouse, all of this area of green. And it includes gardens as well as natural sanctuaries. Actually, the majority of it is natural sanctuaries. And we have quite a variety of plants and animals that are in our natural sanctuaries and garden areas. So there's just an example of one of our gardens but there's an example of one of our natural sanctuaries with all sorts of forests and meadows and wetlands, different types of wetlands. So it's a pretty amazing place. But if, when we, I want to talk about insects, but the other thing I need to do is I need to make sure that we know exactly what an insect is. So I'm going to switch over and we're going to play a little true and false game, give you a chance to sort of think about what insects, what makes an insect. And we are going to concentrate a little bit on butterflies and moths right now. So you can see the first question, butterflies and moths have six legs. What do you think? Yes or no? What do you think? And maybe some of you can put your answer in the chat if you'd like. Or you can just yell out at home, yes or no. I'll give you a couple of minutes, to, a couple of seconds to think about that, and then we'll see what the answer is. And you are absolutely right. They have six legs. So let me show you some examples. So we have an example of a, whoops, Oops, a daisy of a tiger moth here, a lovely oh. tiger moth. And then here we have, and some of you may recognize it, a woolly bear caterpillar. Okay, so actually I happen to have a woolly bear caterpillar. So what I'm gonna do is let me see if I can bring up my camera that has my woolly bear on it. Let's just see where it is. Hold on now. 
No, oh, I don't see it, but that doesn't mean anything. We'll just keep on going because maybe it'll, <clears throat> maybe I'll see it in a, in a minute. Okay, so there is my woolly bear. <clears throat> Let's go to the next question. Let's see what the next question is. And oh, by the way, some of you, you can see the legs on the moth, but do you see the six legs? on the caterpillar. Now, some of you may go going, yeah, yeah, I see. Wait a minute. There are more than six legs. Ah, those are not the legs. These are the legs. So the legs on the little caterpillar are these very sharp little black ones right here. These are, some people call them pro legs or pretend legs. They're fel false legs. They just help that little caterpillar grasp things. Okay, let's go to the, the next question. All right, butterflies and moths have antennae. What do you think? Yes or no? Ah, some yeses, some noes. Let's find out. Oh, I can still see people answering. I'll give you a chance to answer because I know you want to. Okay, let's find out. Yep, they have antennae. They have two antennae. But what's interesting is that a butterfly has very slender, very small, very sort of thin antennae like this. So this beautiful swallowtail has two, but let me show you what a moth has. A moth has antennae that are like this. What word would you use to describe these antennae, the moth's antennae? What, do, what would you, it, what would you uh, des describe it as? Ferns. That's a that's a very interesting analogy. I love that, or I should say, a little metaphor. It's like a like a fern. Some oh, like a leaf. Okay, leaf like. Some people actually call them feathery. So yeah, there you go. Exactly, Milo. They're like feathers. Exactly. So they've got, but they're and they're like this because. Moths tend to be nighttime insects. So they don't use their eyes as much as they use their sense of, what are those antennae for? So they use their sense of not so much touch, but not so much hearing. And I'll tell you about hearing in a minute. Smell, exactly, they use it for smelling. So moths tend to have these feathery or larger antennae so they can smell their food, they can smell the flowers. Whereas butterflies tend to be daytime insects, so therefore they don't need to use their antennae as much for smell as they do other things like their feet, as a matter of fact, they feet they taste things with. Okay, so now the other thing is antennae are used for smell, but what do you use for smell? Your nose, exactly, you use your nose, but wait a minute, what else do you use your nose for? And you're doing it right now. Breathing, exactly. Well, here's the thing. Insects don't have noses. Nope, no noses. So they breathe through little tiny holes on their abdomen. So if you were an insect, it would be like having two noses on the top of your head and then noses along the side of your body. It's kind of cool. As, as our friend uh, Tanner mentioned and, to and Toby mentioned, it is, it is pretty cool, I agree. Okay, let's take a look at our next question and then we're gonna do something else. 
So butterflies and moths have two body parts. What do you think? Yes or no? Okay, let's find out. Let's find out. There seems to be some yeses and nos. And it's a no. So butterflies and moths, like most insects, have three body parts. And that includes the head, which is this first one, and that's where the antenna are and the mouth and the eyes. Then the thorax, that's the middle section with the legs and the wings, so it's a very muscular section. And then we've got the abdomen, which is where, in a sense, the guts are, but that's also where they have those little holes or spiracles that they use to breathe with. But it's the same thing whether it's an adult or a caterpillar. They also have those three parts, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen in just a slightly different size. So those are sort of the three main characteristics of an insect. But how about we stop just for a minute for maybe some questions and I'll let Mally take that. All right, uh, entomologists, <laughs> I know that you are. Allie, it's Katie. I, I, I did see a question quite a bit earlier that was a good one. I thought it was interesting. Uh, Callie asked, there's a rumor that if a butterfly's wings are broken, that you can put them into sugar if, to fix them. Is that true? Uh, that is a very interesting, I, I haven't heard that and I, and I wouldn't advise it actually. Um, no. There are some people that have been, you know, if they find, uh, especially monarchs when we're tagging, there is always a risk. Um, or you might find a monarch that has a, a wing that's slightly bent. Um, people have found ways to look after that, but putting it in sugar isn't really the best idea because you're adding a lot of weight um, to that butterfly when that sugar crystallizes. So a lot more than that little butterfly could handle. Okay, Jenna wants, thanks, Kareen, because I think that's good advice, because sometimes we have old wives tales and <laughs> other times we have good uh, scientific knowledge. So are the butterflies from Jenna, are the butterflies on, monarchs on the way back to Canada now? They absolutely are, Jenna. And what I'll do is let me just show you where they are. So I'm going to share my Google Maps, okay? And then you, I'll show you where they are approximately. Oh, my map's got to catch up with me. Just a minute. Let me give it a chance. Let me see if I can go back here. Okay, hold on. Let me just see if it'll go. There we go. So the monarchs, let's look, keep going a little bit further. A little bit further. There we go. Okay. So the monarchs were right down here in Mexico. And they're actually on their way back. So they've been in Mexico since November, December. They've been resting there. That's a good overwintering place for them. And then they're making their way back. So right now what's happening is they are flying to Texas. And that's where they're going to stop. They're going to mate. And then they'll die. And then those new caterpillars and eventually adults, those ones will eventually then go up and get to sort of the same area as the Carolinas. Those ones will mate, lay eggs and die. Those new eggs, that next generation will then go up and get to Pennsylvania, Ohio sort of area and eventually those ones will mate, lay eggs and die. And then finally the people in Michigan and we in Ontario will get our first generation probably by about the end of May, beginning of June. Oh, and so there's only one generation that lives in eight to nine months. The other generations 
only live between eight and 10, maybe 12 weeks, absolutely tops. But that's not unusual for an insect to have that shorter lifespan. Um, and Corrine, how, um, MacArthur wants to know how do caterpillars breathe inside their cocoons? Oh, well, what happens is in a cocoon or in a, so if it's a caterpillar, if it's a butterfly caterpillar, it's going to be in a chrysalis. If it is a moth, it's going to be in a, whoops, it's going to be in a cocoon. So I happen to have a little cocoon and I now, so let me get my cocoon out here. So here is my, there's my little tiger moth, but here is my cocoon right there. Let me just move that out of the way. There. So there is a cocoon right there. And you can see how fragile it is. But just like the insect, they also have um, those, every, every life stage of that insect will have those little holes in their abdomen or spiracles that will help them breathe. So it's the same thing. It will be as part of their body. Wow, that's fascinating. That's really fascinating. Lily would like to know how much monarch butterflies weigh and um, yeah, how much do they weigh and maybe how big are their eggs? Oh, well, let, okay. So monarch butterflies are very, very, um, very, very light. You, it would feel like even a paper clip is heavier than those monarch butterflies. So let me see if I can, yeah. So, so I happen to have a little video uh, or a little story about monarch butterflies. So there is an egg. So I want you to imagine, I want you to imagine that that little egg, you could fit about 10 of those little eggs on the top of your finger. So just imagine that. And eventually that little egg will get ready to hatch and you'll see a little black thing on top. Well, that little black thing is their head. So what I'm hoping, let's see if we can, if you can see this video. And if you can see this video, you just let me know. I'm gonna make it just jump a little bit. But that is the little caterpillar coming out. So it was breathing through this, very transparent egg and once it gets out it's going to be able to breathe so i'm hoping you can see this video so when an egg an egg will sort of stay an egg for about four or five days and then it will become a caterpillar and once and it's a caterpillar for about 10 to 14 days it's in its chrysalis for about 10 to 14 days and then it's an adult. And there's my little caterpillar, ready to come out. And, and this little caterpillar will end up eating and eating and eating. So there's my husband's thumb. There's that freshly little come out caterpillar. So how are we doing for questions? Because I'm, I've got, Lots of things to share. I even have something live today to share. Oh, share. well, let's just keep going and then we'll, okay, be, yeah. we'll be doing some wonderings and some thinkings as we go along. So keep, just keep thinking, boys and girls, and we'll, uh, we'll get to your questions. I'll write them down. Well, while we're waiting, tell you what, I'm going to show you something here. And you might go, it looks kind of gross, but take a look at this. Okay, so let me just go back a little bit. So this is not a container of potato, old potatoes and oatmeal. I don't know, do you see anything moving? Look at that. Look at that right there. Do you see that? Did you, oh, 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 there it is. Okay, so that, let me see if I can uh, just move things around a little bit. So 
so you can see what it is. So I don't want to put my big finger, my big hand in there. Oh, there he is, there he is. Okay, okay, I'm gonna put my big hand in there and then I'm gonna dig him out and see if we can get him out because they're very fast. Oh, there they are. <laughs> and look how fast they go down. They really don't like to be on camera. Actually, they don't like to be in the light. They like to hide because when they're out, they're very vulnerable. So these, see, they're gone. These are mealworms. Actually, these ones are called superworms. So they're the very large ones. But they are larva. They're there. So we call these larva versus caterpillars. And I've got one here, but he's a little bit quiet. He's not doing a lot of moving around. But let me put him out here so you can see him. There he is. And I'm going to get a little bit closer. There we go. There he is. But you can see he's got little tiny antenna. They're right there. Those are his little tiny antenna. And then and if he if he just cooperates, I don't know if he'll oh, oh, oh. do you see his little legs right there, close to his head? You can see those little legs every so often they'll pop, they'll, they'll become visible, but he moves quite fast. There, there are his little legs, right? And then on the side of his body, it's not easy to see because when I've tried to move him over so you can see on the side of his body in each segment, there will be a little spherical or a little thing that helps them breathe. But eventually they will form a pupa. They will form uh, uh, not a cocoon, not a chrysalis, because it's not a butterfly or moth. They'll form a pupa. That's the general term. And eventually they'll become this. There he is. Now I can't take my lid off because he gets out, but this is a mealworm. I mean, uh, this is a, sorry, this is a darkling beetle. But look at those beautiful antenna of his and look at those six legs. And what do you notice at the end of his legs? Look where his feet, what we might call his feet. Look at those. What do you see there? Yeah, there's, there's little tiny, see there's little tiny hooks almost. And those hooks are gonna help that little beastie move around. Now I noticed somebody asked me what this stuff was that the mealworms were in. It's actually oatmeal. It's my porridge before I cook it. And they also like to eat potatoes and cucumbers and carrots. Yeah, those little claws, you see how he's gripping that oatmeal? See how he's gripping that and holding on to it? And do they bite? Not that I've noticed. I can put him on my hand. At least I think I can. I don't think he's gonna. But those little, those little hooks hold on really well. So there he is on my finger. But the problem is, is the focus is gonna be challenging. Let me see if I can get it back a little bit. There he is. So he's on my finger, but he's not gonna bite me at all. I'm, uh, my skin's too tough. Yeah. I'm gonna put him back in this container if he'll let go of, see the thing is his little claws, they're, they're, really, they're really good claws. So I'm gonna, oops, I'm gonna stop sharing so I can uh, <laughs> move my little guy back. But what I can show you while people are thinking of some questions, what I can show you is, uh, <laughs> look at him, he's, he's still there. What I can show you is, how insects chew and how different it is from what we do. So whenever you think about something, okay, he's not gonna let go. <laughs> he's, on the other, he's on the other, oh, there I've got him, okay. So insects, when they chew their food, where we go up and down, insects do this. So you can try it with me. Put your thumbs up, put your thumbs on your cheeks, Bring your fingers around. That's if insects are chewing eaters, this is how they do it. Think of a think of a caterpillar, and it goes chomp 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 chomp. And that's how the beetle also will eat his potato. 
Okay, so time for questions. Or uh, I'll leave it up to Mally of how we're doing. Oh, what is the difference between a chrysalis and a cocoon? I can show you both. So a, a cocoon, and actually I can show you several. So this is a cocoon. Um, and it's quite, it's quite a large one. The one I showed you earlier, that was from a woolly bear. And they are that, those two they are. That's what they look like. But I'll show you on my document camera to make it a little bit easier. Both of these are cocoons. And so I'm going to put them down here. And then I'll show you that I'll show you a left, I'll show you a couple of chrysalids. Okay, so I'm going to share this. Okay, so let me go back a little bit. And let me get that, that light, light's a little bright. Okay, so let's do it this way. So if you notice, both of the, both of the cocoons are slightly hairy. And what happens is when, when a, a caterpillar, a moth caterpillar, so both of these are from moths, uh, these will both be moths, they make their chrysalis around themselves using the silk. Whereas a butterfly, and I'll show you a video of that in a minute, a butterfly will actually, that chrysalis, and so this is a monarch butterfly chrysalis, and you can see it's much, and here, let me get that light out of the way. It's much finer, and what's really cool about it is that it actually, it actually makes the chrysalis within itself. And I actually have a video of that. Here's another chrysalis that I have. This is from a swallowtail. It's from a swallowtail butterfly. But let me see if I can get my video of the monarch coming out of the... Uh, the chrysalis. So I'm just going to zip through here. One second. And so this might this might answer Daniela and Gabriel's question. How long is the butterfly inside the cocoon? Well, it's in it's inside a chrysalis for about 10 to 14 days. In about 10 to 14 days. And I'm just going to use this. I'm just going to. So I'm hoping you're going to be able to see this. So what happens is the caterpillar goes away from where it's been eating and pooping because it doesn't want to attract any predators. It makes a little silk button on the plant and then eventually it will turn itself around and, um, and then it will latch itself onto that silk button. As you can see, it will happen there. And then it will let go from the side of the plant. So I'm hoping you're able to see this okay. And then right now, at this point, it the chrysalis is being formed inside the caterpillar. So it's so right now, so what's happening is the exoskeleton or the exuvia, that's the outside of the caterpillar. It is being moved and I'm going to try and stop it just to, to point something out to you because you're going to say, okay, so you see what's happening. It's going to straighten out and then what's going to happen. It is kind of gross. Oh, wait, there. Okay. I just stopped it because I wanted you to see this. What's happening is that the skin or the exoskeleton or the exuvia of that caterpillar is being moved up and what is what you are seeing now is the chrysalis so the chrysalis of a butterfly forms from within the cocoon of a moth forms on the outside so i'm going to finish this one so you can see what it looks like and it would take about 20 to 30 minutes from start to finish. And it's just wiggling so that it can attach it. And then as you go, as it continues on, you'll see really well what we all know is a monarch chrysalis. And there it is. So. 
We what? have a lot of wows and cools and ooh, that's so awesome. Thanks for sharing that, Kareem. You're welcome. Okay, another question. Um, do butterflies have bones? No, they don't. They are not like us where we have bones and stuff like that inside our bodies. But butterflies have what are known as exoskeletons. So let me see now. I have something weird. Oh, yes, yes, here it is. Okay, you might even recognize this. So let me just get this out here for you to see. So I'm going to share that. And you may, you might recognize this. Let me just move my, my light over a little bit. Let me move things over there. There. Do, do any of you recognize this beastie? It's not a bee. No, no, it's not a bee. How about in the summertime, when it's very, very hot, you might hear a type of sound. N not a June bug. No, no, no. This is a cicada. So this is the exoskeleton of the cicada larvae. So this is the pupa. So when it comes out, but this is what it looks like. So the exoskeleton is just, you know, when you think of, uh, when you think of um, uh, uh, a lobster or a crab or a crayfish, they have that sort of hard shell on the outside. Well, insects don't exactly have a hard shell necessarily, but their outer covering is their bone. Uh, but we call it an exoskeleton. So this is this is a a cicada um, pupa. So it's a good example of what a uh, exoskeleton looks like. Okay, another question. And I'm letting Mally, um, I'm going to let you decide uh, where we go and how long we go for. Okay, well, we sort of agreed that we, we do half an hour, 40 yep. minutes. So um, how many um, monarchs come back to Canada? Not, not as many as go down. So in, in the trees, in, and let me see if I can get that picture, in the trees in uh, Mexico where they go, there are millions and millions, and I'm just going to sort of zoom through here. There are millions and millions of, uh, I don't know if I'm going to find a picture up there. There are millions and millions of butterflies. So this is what you see brown. That is not dead leaves. Those are monarch butterflies. So there are millions of monarch butterflies that will fly down to Mexico, tens of millions. But what comes back is perhaps um, less than a tenth of that. So, um, and it, they come back very slowly because there are, there are, you know, they won't all make it. They won't all survive the trip back. They don't all survive the trip in Mexico. There are predators, there are birds, and there are um, rodents that will eat these monarchs. Um, they might not have had enough food on their journey down. That's why it's so important that we create gardens, no matter where we are, for all sorts of different insects and other wildlife. If we've removed a garden to put in grass, we should put something else back so that they've got some food. Um, but they will travel, um, but, but there are a lot of deaths. So it's maybe 10% of the total population. And where do, where do they go in Mexico? Is it all over Mexico? No, it's actually not. There's one place in particular. There, you see that there's a little blue star right there. You see all, all, of, the, all of the monarchs from this part of uh, Canada and the United States, they all make their way down to this reserve. And this is a, it's a, it, this year they had, they, in other, it, it was only about 2.5 square kilometers of land. 
and that is not a lot of land. Other year in in the past, a long time ago, it used to be as much as twenty square kilometers. But there have been a lot of logging and agriculture and removal of habitat. So that's why, as you can see, if you look at this picture, you can see how some of that forest has been removed for farming and stuff like that. Um, so it, it is, it's one of the issues that uh, the monarchs have. But they're just an example of a species that needs to have a lot of, a lot, a lot of habitat to survive. And uh, I, I noticed there's someone, uh, Nicholas and Noah. Um, the, so if you are in Ontario, um, monarch butterflies are a species at risk. And they're, because they're a species at risk, they are under the protection um, of the Ministry of, Natural, uh, Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. And because of that, um, if you are going to collect um, you need to have a permit, but by all means, have milkweed in your garden, have lots of nectar flowers in your garden to support all the stages of the life cycle and do your observations there um, and report your observations to places like Journey North or Mission Monarch, which is a Canadian one. Okay. I'm going to stop sharing and see if there's another question that people would like okay. to answer. Or maybe we've used up our time. So Mally, I, 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 you may be, you're on mute. Yeah, 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 sorry. That's okay. I, maybe you can tell the students um, just in the last couple of minutes why it's important to keep the insects safe and why we need them in our backyards and in our gardens. Mm hmm. Well, a lot of the insects um, are important for not only um, our food, but also the food of all sorts of other animals. They help pollinate them. They help um, take care of pest insects. Uh, they're very important because that's how some of, you know, when you're, when, when you, uh, if you have a compost in your backyard, those insects and relatives of insects like um, uh, pill bugs and millipedes and centipedes, all of those animals are so important because they're the ones that are eating and decompose, helping those, uh, helping our, our, our vegetable matter and our fruit matter decompose. They're the helps, ones that are helping make soil for our plants. Also, you may, it may, it's not the nicest thing, but it's important thing the caterpillars are some uh, butterflies that lay lots and lots and lots and lots, like thousands of eggs. Well, those caterpillars end up being food for the songbirds. So, you know, not only are those caterpillars eventually going to become adults, but they're also potentially food for other animals. So it's a very intricate web of how important these insects are in our lives and the lives of the environment. So Kareen, I just want to thank you so much for connecting with our students. And we know that you do have another couple of sessions booked with us. One of them is going to be about extreme insects. So we're going to learn about all the really cool and mm -hmm. crazy insects that are out there. So I hope the students watch the, the At Connected Home um, website so that they know where to connect and we are so grateful that you made your studio in the basement so that you could continue to talk to us at connected north and all our friends all over the world and we just want to thank you we're going to give everybody a karina a high five and a virtual applause <laughs> and thanks for coming guys thank you very much everybody for joining me at royal botanical gardens in, uh in karin's basement <laughs> Thanks so much, Karin. We'll see you later. Take Bye. care. Bye, Bye. guys.